This is a talk uh, called Data Wizard that is just a big placeholder name. Um, so I'm Substack from the internet. Um, also, I'm in Oakland, California, which is the home of NPM, and a lot of the things about the kids are And thanks for having me at your data. So I'm going to talk about a few things tonight. Mostly just what I've been working on lately, which is uh, data replication. And actually, data replication is quite easy. There are hard problems around data replication, but data replication itself, it's super easy. So I'll just show you how to do that. Um, first thing that we'll be using, that I'll cover pretty briefly, but a little bit, is called LevelDB. So LevelDB is the Node.js database. As Max Ogden probably said that at some point, or Dominic Tarr, somebody like that. Um, the great thing about LevelDB is it's super modular. So LevelDB itself is just basically a couple of methods. Um, it's get, it's grab, it's delete, it's create, read, stream. Um, really importantly, it also has batch, which lets you do atomic inserts, which is very important if you want to implement indexing. And with these simple primitives, you can build pretty much any kind of robust database abstraction. Um, so create read stream is also kind of interesting because a bit like the first talk tonight, uh, where you have to think in keys, in level DB, everything is keys. So it's a key value store, and you specify everything in terms of greater than and less than ranges. So what does that look like? Well. Let's just play around. So here I have some data in a JSON file. Um, just some simple things, key dog, key cat, key cat, key horse, some arbitrary values. So if we want to insert that into the database, well, first of all, we have to create a level to be instance. So we just require the level module like this after you npm install it. And you just fire one up. So make something in temp. So with level to be, all that you have to do is pass the file path. And then we can just do db.batch and require that JSON file I just showed you and run it. So what this should do is it should insert all of the records in data.json into our database. So if we do that, then now I can comment that out and I can do db.get cat and print the result. So that's just a standard callback error, error first. So if I run that, hooray! Cat, cat's value is one to three, which is correct. So there are, there are a couple of other fun things you can do with level to be. So covered batch, this does atomic inserts. So either everything succeeds or everything fails, which is a very nice property when you want to insert indexes and have everything be in a consistent state. Um, there's get, which I just showed, as you might expect. There's also put and delete, stuff like that. But more interesting than that is create read stream. So with create read stream, um, I'll just do a simple thing to print values out. So with create read stream, you can specify greater than or less than values, and these are the keys. So the keys were cat, dog, and horse. So if we want to, for example, list everything greater than cat, not exclusive, but just greater than, so greater than cat, what will that do? Well, I run it. Dog and horse, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> greater than or equal to will print everything, or it should. Um, so, yep, so there we just have everything. So you can, you can using these very simple primitives, um, start partitioning your data. So, for example, if we wanted to, instead of having just flat values and keys, which is not actually all that useful, like this, where we have cat, dog, and horse, um, this, this works okay if you only have one type of data, but maybe we start prefixing things like animal. It's common in level DB to use the exclamation point because it's the first principal ASCII character. I think. Hit. Something, something like that. Everybody uses that, so it must be true. Um, so we can start doing something like this, and now if we want to start adding other kinds of animals or other, other kinds of, of relations in our database, we can do that. So. For example, maybe we want to have a message type in addition to an animal type. So we have a message and then our delimiter, maybe the cat, and a timestamp. So that's a timestamp, right? Looks legit. <laughs> and maybe we have a dog message that says, well, it's a 
dive or something. Says, well, so now if we want to get all of the messages by cat, we can write something that looks like this. So we would say message cat if we are greater than or less than would uh, be cat exclamation mark and then an ampersand. Or sorry, a tilde is a it's a high ASCII character. I think it's 126 or 127, something like that. Um, anyways, if you care about Unicode, you should use this, but whatever. <laughs> In this case, it's fine. So, whoops, you have to do it correctly. Uh, commas. Commas. Do that. It doesn't work. It's something silly. Um, let me look at the data again. So I won't dwell on this too long, but let's see. Message chat. Oh, right. So, Greater than, less than. Well, something silly. I tend to. Did you write the data? Yeah. Did I write the data? Took the data. Oh, I already did that previously. Did it just keep the same out? Yeah, it's persistent. So oh, that's all you have to do for persistence. It's really great. But Thanks for asking that question. File. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Did you change the data in the JSON file? Uh, no. Did you write that to the database? It will not, unless I uncomment this out. Or I could do db.put or something to change the data. But, very good question. It's like, it's like a planet of question or something. Anyways, uh, this would normally work if I wasn't doing everything completely loud. But that's a risky run. Okay, so anyways, that's level DB basically. So, a lot of these slides I took out of a talk I gave in Taiwan last week. So, I really love how in traditional Chinese, they have this really compact representation for the word lexicographic ordering. It's just that. Three <laughs> Unicode characters means that. So I really love that. I wish. I think we should start using this, this combination. It's very succinct. Basically, this idea is that it's a bit like I was showing with greater than or less than. Things appear in string order. So A come A A A comes before B B B comes before C C C. This can get a little bit unintuitive when you start dealing with numbers because one comes first, but then 10 comes next instead of two or four or something like that. So a little bit unsuited. But luckily, because we're using Node.js, we can use NPM. One of the packages that can help us with this is called ByteWise. So ByteWise gives you more intuitive representation of not just numbers, but all kinds of types. So the basic idea from ByteWise was just ripped wholesale out of CatchDB because it's a really good idea. So the, the catch to be MapReduce system has this way of, of ordering things where null comes before any number, comes before any string, comes before any array. But importantly, arrays are sorted component-wise, which means that every element in the array is sorted according to these very same rules. It's recursive, which is a very handy property um, because you can do things like this. So instead of partitioning things with an explicit delimiter like an exclamation mark, like I was showing, you can actually use arrays and you don't have to worry about escaping things or weird stuff like that. It's just very nice. So you can also have other kinds of data like posts. Oh, I think that's why I was messing it up. So, um, so this this would be all of the posts string by a timestamp, but importantly, we could do an atomic insert with, with batch. So you also insert an index, like a post user that where the user comes first. And this is useful if you want to, for example, query all of my posts all of the posts by Substack, or all of the posts by Dominic Park. Or if we just want to get all of the posts, maybe like the three most recent posts, we could start querying from just the post. So that's the basics of how ByteWise works. So let's, let's use it. So we take our previous example and delete everything. And do that. So we can now uh, specify an encoding in LevelDB. So this is a key encoding. And you just require ByteWise, like that. And also set a value encoding in JSON. It's kind of handy. So, to do this, uh, I have another file called users.json. This is just the user data I showed in the slides. So, users and posts and post users. So, if I go in and db.create read stream with a less than and a greater than, like this. So, Greater than, uh, <coughs> first of all, let's just list the users. That's simple, right? So uh, if you remember from the ByteWise slide, null is the first possible value, and undefined is the last possible value. So 
these are very handy if you want to do queries. So we'll do greater than or equal to less than undefined, like that. So if we print out all of the values, we should get all of the users. We don't. Oh, I forgot to populate the database. Right. Forget that. Require users of JSON. Okay. What do we do? We get the users. Hooray. And nothing behind my sleeves, because if I comment that out, it's persistent. So they're still there. Okay. <laughs> so that's very useful if you want to just list the users, which you can do in any kind of database, right? Just, why are you showing me this? Is it person? <laughs> Um, any database can do this. Why, why is this a feature? This is ridiculous. Well, um, I'll get to that. But not just yet. So <coughs> some other things that we might want to do with this approach are to like query all of the posts by users. So if we want to query all of the posts by a user, we can write a query that looks something like this. So I think it's called post user, actually. So if we take user from process rv2, then we can note .js substack and we get all of the posts by substack. Very good. And uh, so we actually, uh, so in the database, I inserted just null values, so just zeros, because we can actually reconstruct all of the information that we need solely from the keys. So to make this example complete, now um, when we traverse the data, like so, or if you want to be the fancy person about it, you can do things correctly and not use streams one everywhere like a crutch. So we'll do that. And I'm still using through like a crutch because it's so nice. Okay. Totally not a crutch. Okay. <laughs> well, because the alternative would be lines and lines and lines of verbose nonsense. So still have to do that. Whatever. So anyways, so now for every row, uh, we can actually do another query. So ddb.get for row.key. Um, so remember from the command line output, the first item is post user, and the second is substack, and then the timestamp. So the timestamp is the key of two. And if we look at the data again, um, which is in users.json, then the posts have this structure. So basically, we just have to swap the timestamp and the username around in our key. So let's do that. And then I will get to something that actually matters. So we create the post with row key, uh, row key of two, and then row key of one. We should get some posts. And I'll do an XGMAX because the ordering doesn't have a slot. He's pushing your right. What? Thanks, audience. 17. <laughs> You guys are good. There we go. Right, and I have to uh, tell it what user name. And then it was a <laughs> course. Being a stream, stream stream, you have to set it to object mode, of course. Hooray, it worked. So there are some messages. Um, so this is a bit weird. I mean, this is nothing like you would run MySQL or Postgres or MongoDB, right? So what's the benefit? Benefit is, this is all I have to do to set up my database. It's so great. Um, and then you can, because you just have an instance, you can pass it around to all kinds of modules. So there, there are hundreds of packages on NPM that expect a LevelDB handle as an argument. So if you make one of those, you can just pass it around, and all of a sudden, you can do all of this other crazy stuff, like geospatial indexing, um, all kinds of wacky things. One of the wacky things, which I'll get to in a moment. But first, content addressable data. So I, I said, maybe, if I can remember to, I said that this talk would be about replication. So now that I've showed you LevelDB, which is sort of the, the base tool that I needed to implement this, the other useful tool is called content addressable data. That's where you take content and, well, I think it's best represented by this haiku. So this is the <laughs> for haiku. I think it is. I wrote a dictionary program, so I don't know if it's correct, but it seems plausible. So, <laughs> the key of document is the hash of its content. 
addressable blob. <laughs> My program also told me that that was what the translation was, so it looks really cool. Um, what does this mean? So, what this means is you can write a program like this, and you can do repair blob equals require content addressable blob store. Um, I'll call it blob store. I think I'll call that one blob, and I'll call it this one store. So, you make a blob store by giving it a directory, blobs, just like that. And now you have a content addressable blob store. That's great. What is a content addressable blob store? Well, I'll tell you. It means that when you save a document, the key is the hash of that content. So it's like if you made a document called Hello World, and that was the content, and then you saved it with that key, for example. This is a content addressable blob store. It's a very simple idea. It's very powerful because when you save a document, you're always necessarily pointing backwards at time. So you can only point at things that exist in some fashion somewhere. Um, and you can never do the opposite because you can never point at something that doesn't exist because you have to generate it, i.e. make it exist, to point at it. So it's, it has a very useful property that I'll get to more in a bit. But anyways, so we're using content addressable blob stores, right? So, how do we do that? Well, we process that standard in dot pipe store dot create write stream, like so. Actually, I should save that to variable first. So we make a write stream, and we listen for the finish event, and by the time the finish event fires, then w dot p has been populated with the hash of the content, which is to, like the shasam or something like that. So, if I just print w dot p, and pipe standard in into this right stream, then I should be able to create a blob. There we go. So I made a blob, and let's make another blob too. Yo, there we go. So now we have some hashes, which is great. So I want to turn this blob store from creating things to showing them. And now we store up create read stream and take the key from from an argument. So process rg2, and then that's a new So let's call it power now. Nothing really. So extend it out. So you do that with blob thing. Now you can read them out again. Cool. So this is the basics of how a blob store works. So there's this great thing called abstract blob store that's a spec for these things. So they all implement basically this interface, and you can use blob stores for uh, S3 or like browser things or all kinds of wacky backends I'm going to save too. They're all using the same interface, so it's really easy to swap them out if you, if you need to store blobs somewhere else. But importantly, this is a very good primitive for building a database that has attachments, blobs of content. So you can basically implement something that has big chunks of data you don't want to store in a database because maybe it could be hundreds of kilobytes or megabytes even of images or something. I think the first talk alluded to that a little bit. You don't really want to be putting images or video files into a no, no SQL database like directly. Let's don't do that. So, so the nice thing is, because of that property I was talking about earlier where where if you link to something, it necessarily points back in time is very useful for replication because it sort of establishes this causal ordering for you automatically. And what that means um, is that it's just very easy to write these things. So all that you have to do is write a system that resolves the links go forward, only for performance reasons, right? Because you can, you can generate that information uh, from a complete table scan and just take a while. So it's all indexing. Um, so if you include the hash of things you want to point to in the document itself, then it's part of the hash, basically. Um, why is that important? Well, so I think it shouldn't even, you, don't, you shouldn't even need to explain this, but then you, as a user of a system like this, have control over your data. So you can do whatever the fuck you want with it. So if the service is shut down, who cares? You spin up your own service, it's great. Or Service goes Oracle, <laughs> then that's also not a threat. Um, because you can just take the data, especially if it's if it's been licensed transparently and openly, then you can just do whatever the fuck with it. It's 
Great. Um, and a caveat to this, why replication is important, why a particular kind of replication called multi-master replication is important. This is something that only a few databases can do. CatchDB can do it all right. Um, I'm, I'm mostly riffing on ideas that CatchDB has, because I've used that before. Um, with a few important exceptions that I'll get into in a bit. But you can edit data locally on your own replica, push it to another replica, and then it'll be in sync. So I think multi-master replication, when it's done the most correctly, works so that there is really no single point that has all of the data. There's no like canonical source of truth. That also means you have to throw away the notion that a key maps to a single value, but I think this is just a representational problem, and it's very worth solving that. So, um, there you go. So, the easy problems are replication. This is a solved problem, basically. There are all kinds of people who've written about this. Um, I'll just show you a way that I did it. It's, it's pretty straightforward. People write papers about this stuff. They also write papers about atomicity and redundancy and reliability and scaling. So, these are easy because people wrote about them and they have good solutions that operate under a number of constraints. So if you have approximately the problem that they have, then you know what the solution is. You can pretty much look it up. So what are the hard problems? User interfaces. One of the hardest problems in computing, I think. And along with that is the problem of telling the computer what to do as opposed to what it shouldn't be doing, is also one of the hardest problems. So that's also the hardest problem with a system like this. So building a user interface that can cope with the fact that there might be multiple versions of a document and representing that well is a very hard problem. Well, it's not that hard. That problem isn't that hard. But telling the computer what you want it to do is always a hard problem because you might want to replicate part of the data set only. You might want to only push or only pull or all kinds of things you might want to do. So I won't be solving those problems because they're human problems and I'm not a venture back startup. I'm just some guy. I don't even work anywhere. I'm just here telling you things. But I can show you some modules for the easy problems. So first one is called ForwardDB. This is like a link juggler. So this is that idea I was just talking about where, OK, so you create a document C and B points to C and then A points to B. So you might create a document C that has this hash and uh, no metadata, because it's the first document, but then B points back with this previous hash to C, which is identified by that hash, and then A points to B, identified by that hash. So that's great. You can basically do this kind of linear chain. But what's interesting is that documents don't have to necessarily point to the latest hash. And in fact, many documents can point to the same hash. And then you end up in this case where there are multiple heads pointing at the same thing. But in forward to be in fork to be and everything I'm making, that's completely OK. Um, because I think that maps better to the inherent physics of what's going on. Like, if there is no inherent source of truth, there is no the database, like the master replica, then you really can't have any sense where there is like a single value for a single key. We should just throw away that notion, because what we get is very, very powerful. Um, so how does ForwardDB work? So this is this thing I've written fairly recently. Um, oh, I thought I had a camera in here. It's not. Anyways, I'll just talk in that directory, whatever. <laughs> I'm so unprepared. Anyways, <laughs> so I should read the source again to know what's going on. OK, so uh, using ForwardDB, you can create a document. So we'll call it Yo and we'll pipe some data into it. So, or that, that doesn't even, whatever, I'm just gonna use a better one for this. So, we just use ForkDB, which uses ForkDB in German. Anyways, so we create a document, we give it the name Yo, and we pipe some data into it. Yo London. And I should give it that directory, actually. That'll be important. Okay, so we created a hash. That's our hash. Uh, we could, if we wanted to, read it back out again. So we do something like get, I don't even know if that'll work, but who cares? Okay, so that, whatever, it's, it's in there. Must be in there. Um, 
But the important thing is we have this hash. And so we can now query the heads of the database for a key. So the yo is that hash that we just generated. So we can generate a new hash now. So under the same key, we'll create a new document that has the content sing, and then we'll link back to the previous document. Like so, now if we query the heads, there's still one head, but it's the new document, not the old document. And we can actually just query the history of the current version. And it shows us all of the documents in the history, because if you're building something that replicates then you want to preserve every document because you need that information because other people might have older versions of things, you might have newer versions of things, and it has to sort of shake itself out. So if you do this kind of thing, then you can do that. But importantly, if two people try to create different versions of the same document, so we had a document called Zing, or that had the content Zing, but what if we have a new document that points back to that previous document? So in most databases that do replication, this would be, oh no, conflicts, abort, or don't let it happen, do something, to, like blow up, <laughs> not this thing. Because um, I've been bitten by that in the past, it's not pleasant. So if we query the heads, there's just two of them, that's fine, right? You can even have more documents. So like CacheDB, for example, has this mode where the one with the most rights wins, but I don't think that's a good idea because you're still losing data. Just don't lose data. It's easy. Just have multiple copies right there in front of you. It's fine. Um, so we can do that. So we'll make a new document that like links on one of them. So leave that one, echo, heap, boost, do that. Create data all over the place, what of it? And make another one. And that will link, hang on. That will link to the other guy. There we go. So now we should have two heads still. Yep, so now we still have two heads of the, of the data, but now we have like five documents or so, maybe six. Um, so what's cool is if you create a document that links to two documents in the history, <coughs> then you'll sort of merge things back together. So this is basically the data model that Git uses. Git is a content addressable data store, and you link back to multiple documents when you want to sort of merge something together. So that's what I'll do here. So the first one, uh, I'll take that hash, and I'll take the second hash, and I'll echo some data to it. I'll merge. And so now, if we query the heads, there's only one head. Perfect. So that's just all with this. Uh, it's basically what ForgeDB lets you do. It just does the link juggling. Um, it has some stuff where you can actually insert links out of order, and it saves them to a dangling reference. It, with ByteWise, it's just called like underscore dangling or something. I don't even remember. It doesn't matter, because it's a module, so you don't have to care. That's the benefit of modules. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd have to like read a bunch of schema tables or something. Not so with this. You just stuff it in the sub-level. You don't even look at it. It's great. So. Um, that's for db. So the other part of replication is figuring out what data each participant in a replication needs. So I wrote this little module hash exchange to do that. So basically, um, so here I'm just generating some hashes for some data. So everything on rdb gets stuck into this data object, and the shasm is the key, and the message, and the value is the message. So once we have that data, we can fire a hash exchange. Um, it takes a stream as the result, so you just return the stream, put a hash, etc. Or provide to say, I have these hashes, and then the other end of the connection says, I have these hashes. And then they do this dance where this available message fires and you can request hashes from the other end. This is really nice primitive because this gives you out of the box multi master style replication. It also has some tricks under the hood for doing sequencing with vector blocks, which gives you something akin to like, you know, how most things do replication, which is efficient. You don't have to store, you don't have to send all of the hashes in your history when you replicate with another node if you interacted with them in the past. So you call request, and if you just want to pull from somebody, then you just call request, and you don't um, actually provide anything. You're just like a leecher. Um, if you just want to push, 
then you don't call request at all, but you provide the hash loop that you have that you are safe. So this is a nice primitive for doing replication, but if you don't care, if you only want to broadcast, or you only want to consume, you can also do that with some small tweaks. So I think it's pretty, pretty reasonable for me. Then you can just read the responses it comes in. So yeah, there's that. And in this case, for this example, I'm just using standard in and standard out because it's the easiest thing because you don't have to fire up TCP service or whatever. So I wrote this fun thing uh, called, called dupe sh that lets you spin up two processes and it wires the standard out of the first to the standard in of the second and the standard out of the second to the standard in of the first. <laughs> Which is great because then you don't have to like wire up a bunch of like TCP nonsense or whatever to just like type two things together for a symmetric protocol, which this is. Um, so what does that look like? Well, I have an example right here that uses hash exchange. This is the one I showed in the slides. So let's exchange some hashes. So I'll use this dupe sh thing to run the exchange program. Uh, that's too long, I'm gonna call it ex.js, okay. Cool, dupe sh. No uh, A, B. So the first one will have the messages A, 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 B, 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 C, C, C. The second one will have the messages B, 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 uh, Q, 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 B, B. <coughs> so if I run both of those, cool. So these messages got transferred over the wire. Q, 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 which A did not have. Z, Z, Z that A did not have. A, A, A that, that the second one did not have, and C, C, C that the second one did not have. So everybody got the hashes that they needed. Great. Um, that's basically what hash exchange does. So we can take all of this stuff and just use it from ForkDB as modules to replication. So it's actually quite simple. So I've already got that uh, database in temp A that has some junk in it. So and I can make this. B temp A list. Cool. So we have some data. So I can make a new database in B. Actually, why don't I just nuke both of those? Okay. So we'll just create some new data real fast. BOP, of course. Robots. Wait, yo, A. Hang on. And then I have to do the correct database temp A. Okay, and now create rule, and then link back to the previous one, and now I will create a new database that points at something that this database doesn't even have, that's fine, um, and I'll call it temp B for the data directory, and I'll just link back to something that already exists. And now I can merge the two things using the deep sh thing that I just showed. So fork db temp a sync and fork db temp b sync. So these will now exchange hashes and replicate, like multi master. So we do that. And now um, temp b has all of the documents in a plus its own documents. And likewise, for B, so they, or for A, rather. So they have the same document set. So they've replicated effectively. Um, they can merge as much as they want. I can run like heads to see what the heads are on either database um, of the particular B. So they are the same. There are actually two heads. So if I want to merge those, I can actually just merge it on a single database. Go all merged, yo and just set two previous references, like so. And then, so now B is consistent, so for db on temp B, heads, there's only one head. And so on A, there's still two heads, it's unmerged, but I can just resync them. And now A is the same as B. Great, so hooray, you can do multi-master replication. That's all that it basically takes. It's like actually not that hard. The bulk of it is in this module, 4GB, which is, you know, 222 lines. There you go, I'll just scroll past this. Okay, 
So that's all that it takes, pretty much. There you go. Um, that's an easy problem, like I said. So on top of this, I'm building this thing called WikiDB that is like all that I just showed you, but it also adds timestamps, local timestamps, and it sort of does some tricks with causality, like because you can only create a hash after it exists. So that's basically to build the recent changes feed, which is a great thing for a wiki because then everybody can see all of the updates. It's super nice. And like you can just combat spam by just making sure that people addictively read the recent changes feed because they'll just do that um, by automatic. And so for all of this, I'm, I'm making all of these tools in this case, for my own personal case, for this thing called CyberWizard Institute, which will be like a boot camp, but totally not corporate. So it's just free, it's run at our hackerspace. You learn like Unix, JavaScript, all this great stuff, collaboration. Um, but it's gonna be a real thing, like for a solid month, every weekday, like five hours a day, it's gonna be great. So I'm building this system called uh, How To that will let you read these command line based cookbooks, of which I have a few. So all of the lecture notes are going in this, but if you want to do something like, I don't know, how to do cookies <coughs> for my website, so you can just do like how to search cookies and you'll get a few articles about parsing and setting cookies, and they're, they're pretty simple and straightforward. Um, like here's some examples, and there you go. That's all of the stuff. So you should also, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, do the Level Me Up workshop on NodeSchool.io, which is a great little um, command line adventure. So you just go through them one by one. I wrote stuff for this, but I haven't even finished them all. So I wrote this one, device, which I haven't finished it very much. Anyways, um, coming soon is that Wikipedia cookbook. I really want uh, other people to help me write stuff if they want, if they feel like it which would be very easy because you can just clone it and put stuff locally and push it wherever you want. So, um, also if you have a spare couch, I haven't figured out a place yet, but otherwise it's fine. <laughs> find a hospital or something cheap. So, thanks. That's my job.